Hi, my name is Brian Winslade. I'm the director of the Alliance Engagement Department for the World Evangelical Alliance. And welcome to uh, the first of what we plan to be a regular dialogue with leaders of national evangelical alliances around the world. The Alliance Engagement Department, or AED, exists to serve the member alliances of the WEA through liaison, communication, resourcing, uh, collaboration with other WEA ministries and departments. Our aim is to be a source of encouragement and information as you fulfill the mission that God has given you in your particular evangelical alliance. Well, I, I wanted to do something more than just send a letter. So, hey, thanks for taking the time to watch this little video presentation. Our hope is that you'll give us 30 minutes of your time. You'll grab a cup of tea or coffee and uh, allow us to encourage you with ideas and initiatives as we feature a ministry or a, a resource that's associated with the WEA that you might want to explore further. There are over 140 national evangelical alliances around the world led by people like yourself. Let's build community amongst us as we serve the churches and the ministries within our respective countries. In this first episode, we're focusing on the decade of disciple making and well, what's been happening since the WEA Global Assembly in Indonesia. At the Global Assembly in Indonesia in December 2019, the WEA embraced a, a special emphasis on disciple making over the next decade. And at the heart of what it means to be an evangelical Christian is the command Jesus left us to make disciples of all nations. It's actually supposed to be the air that we breathe. It's a responsibility that the church will be held accountable for. So to help provoke this emphasis around the world, uh, a special task force was established by the WEA, and it's been facilitated by uh, Ruslan Maliuta. So, so Ruslan, tell us, what, what, why is disciple making an issue for which the WEA actually needs to adopt it as a special emphasis? The obvious reason is, as you just said, that that's what Jesus commanded us. So one of the most known words are, go and make disciples of all nations. And we all know that this is the essence of the Great uh, Commission for the entire church. But as we are thinking about this further, and especially why, why now, why WEA, like why in this specific way, there are many different ways how we can approach answering this question. I want to suggest three things, You're thinking about three things. Of course, at the heart of what we are trying to do, uh, at the WEA is to serve the church, serve the global church, be a platform for collaboration, for unity, uh, be a voice both within and uh, the church and to the world. And uh, as I'm thinking about this, I think there are three challenges that we can uh, discern that are happening globally. One is stagnation. We can see that in many places, churches are not growing, things are stagnating. So what's needed is spiritual renewal. And often when we think of spiritual renewal, we think about this in terms of revival. Something exciting needs to happen, an event or something that kind of will help us to break through the stagnation. But in reality, what is probably needed even more, I, nothing against revivals, by the way, I love revivals, but what's needed more is a journey, is a process. Process that actually, that's what disciple making is about, is people figuring out what it means to follow Christ day in and day out, wherever they are and whatever they do. And that's what will lead to spiritual renewal and what will help to break through this stagnation and lead to growth and health of, uh, of church communities. The second, another challenge is us being often in a responsive or even reactive mode. We, we hear about things that uh, that are not good and we're trying to figure out what to do about them. And, and often it means that we often play catch up. We often kind of uh, things are moving on and we are trying to figure out what to do with them. And again, I, I know that someone says, so what does that have to do with disciple making? Again, disciple making in its essence is following Christ and following Christ meaning being discern, discernful, being proactive. So we are not only responding to the issues we see, we understand what's happening, we 
hear God's uh, voice, we discern what he's doing, and we align ourselves accordingly. And I think that's what really needed in the in the time when we face COVID. I know it's probably every conversation these days had to have that. <laughs> but there are many other challenges, COVID, uh, refugees, wars, other issues. So I won't even uh, try to uh, describe all of them. But uh, so and some of them are so big that it may seem like there is nothing we can do. But what we can try to do is to discern what God is doing and then align ourselves accordingly and that can only happen through disciple making that can only happen as we try to follow Christ and the, the third thing is what we often can see is churches and Christians particularly evangelical Christians being on the margins being marginalized we talk about influence but that often does not really happen and we don't see good evidence of this and at the same time we know that we want to see society change and society transform. And again, that's that's the matter of disciple making. As people individually and in communities are going through those changes, they're able then to bring this uh, spirit of transformation and this real impact in whatever area they are interacting with. Well, I mean, for the WEA to do something about this, we, we've uh, established a uh, little task force that's been working away for nearly a couple of years now. Uh, you've been leading that task force. They're enthusiastic practitioners. Where, where do they come from? Yeah, it's as, as uh, we were preparing for the General Assembly back in 2019. So that's how the task force came. It was even before we knew how it's actually going to shape up. So the initial group of people came together in preparation for the assembly with the idea that we don't want just to focus on the conference itself. We want to ask the question, what can be done after the event? How we can strengthen the message, strengthen the emphasis of the event? So that's how the original, uh, back then it was called follow-up team, came together. And when it became clear that this emphasis is something that is being owned and embraced by the WA community, then the decision was made, let's make this an ongoing task force that will focus on serving the WA and serving WA family in terms of how to continue with this emphasis of disciple making. And this is a truly global task force. We have people from pretty much every, almost every continent, every part of the world. The people, some of the people on the team are those who spend literally their life uh, uh, focusing on disciple making and uh, practitioners like that. Some are younger leaders that uh, alliances recommended. So it's a very diverse team, men and women of different uh, ages and different uh, generations. So, uh, so this is the group of people that have been working together for past number of months, or almost like you said, almost two years now, yes, yes. to carry this message forward. Let, let me ask you this, Razan. A, a term like discipleship seems to have a range of meanings and, and emphases. Uh, there are some people that see it as like follow up after a person comes to faith in Christ, whereas others speak of it as kind of part and parcel of the evangelism process, in fact. Uh, some speak of discipleship as like, mentoring of younger leaders, uh, perhaps like the Apostle Paul, disciple Timothy. What, what, what's the working definition that the WEA is promoting when it comes to disciple making? It, it's a great question. And I would say that everything that you describe kind of fits under disciple making concept. But at the same time, one of the problems that we've discovered or we've seen this is that we often tend to think about discipleship or disciple making as a program or as some particular element of what we do in the church and then sort of put it in that box and 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 then often what happens is that many people say well that's not what i do i mean i don't do uh, this kind of activity so probably discipleship or disciple making is not for me so the question of what is disciple making is a really important one and we've spent a great deal of time looking at that so i'm really glad that wa now came up with a very simple, but I think very compelling and biblically based uh, definition of what it is. And it is, again, very simple. It's following Christ and helping others to know and follow Christ. Mm. So it almost sounds ridiculously simple, but that's really what disciple making is. And it also means that it's not uh, some kind of just a particular program. It's literally for everyone. And it's something that any person uh, needs to be uh, to be experiencing or needs to be participating in. 
I was going to ask you a question about that. So, so whose responsibility is it to actually make disciples? Is is everyone, every Christ follower involved in this, or is this actually something that only certain people with particular spiritual gifts might engage in? Yeah. yeah. Again, it's like that's why definition is so important because if it's a particular program or sort of model then many of us would say well that's not for me i don't do this kind of things so i for my calling is something else i preach or i do social uh, work and so on but uh, but uh, when we really gra grasp what jesus meant when he said as you're going make disciple of all nations we understand that it's everyone's responsibility uh, so it's a whole of life deal for for all of us but, but let me let me ask this question because this this little presentation goes out to uh, leaders of evangelical alliances around the world i mean g given that disciple making is more a ministry emphasis for for local churches uh to engage with what what, what kind of things can a national evangelical alliance do to actually encourage and resource the churches in their nation in, in this whole deal? It's a great question. And I know that some, again, for some people may think, while well, I mean, we are not disciple making mission, we are not a local church. Why do we have to be involved in this? And I think part of this vision or this call of a decade of disciple making is for each of us to think, how am I doing? in this way like how am i doing as a disciple of christ not in terms of how they am doing in the, in the programmatic involvement but let's say if i'm a leader of a national alliance how am i discipling others am i being discipled and someone may say well i'm already following christ for 30 years do i really need to be discipled and i would say probably yes and i'm not approaching it from a negative viewpoint like oh there is something wrong in my life so that's why i need to be discipled no from a perspective that following christ is a lifelong journey and we need to be helping each other to do that so so approaching it from this perspective starting how am i doing how, what I can do to help those people that are around me, starting with my family, starting with my co-laborers, and then, and then of course, it extends to our ministry and our work environment. So in this case, national alliances can play a really important role because national alliance is is an epicenter of what, in a way, of what God is doing in that country. <clears throat> so for the national alliance to be a, to be a platform that gives a very clear voice to the church calling the church to revitalize focus, being a platform that brings different parts of the church together for a dialogue, for a conversation, for sharing stories, for sharing resources. Because while disciple making is not about a particular model or program, we do need models. Mm -hmm. Like as a parent, I'd love to understand better how other parents are helping their kids to follow Christ effectively. So as a national alliance, I would imagine we would want to know how uh, if, how different churches are doing that, how different leaders are doing that, how different countries are doing that. So I would say that National Alliance has a very key role to play in this. And that's why, again, not about promoting a particular program, but about promoting this way of thinking and this way of life, mm. and also figuring out the specific ways how it can be done in the context that they are operating in. Well, that's a great segue into the next question that I wanted to put to you. Uh, there must be some examples out there already of what some alliances are doing. What, what, what are some of these examples of, of uh, alliances engaging in this disciple-making emphasis already? There are some good examples for past four or five years uh, within denominations or just uh, movements of people that are saying, yeah, we really need to start, start thinking about this. We really need to address this. There are examples of particular alliances that have really taken it uh, seriously. It starts, often starts with the leadership thinking through this and thinking about this vision and, and contextualizing this vision in, in, in uh, the environment that they operate. It also, a uh, big part of this is identifying who are the champions, who are the people right. that can drive this forward, and then what are the ways how to uh, bring churches together in the country. Like I want to specifically say that Latin America is really a hot spot for this, but there are, of course, alliances in other parts of the world, in Asia, in Africa, that are also taking this on. Where can people find resources and ideas uh, from the Decade of Disciple-Making Task Force? 
as we are uh, as we are working on this so from the wa viewpoint as we are thinking about this vision there are several things that uh, we hope and pray and work to see happen one is uh, for the evangelical community to have a clear vision and be aligned around this shared understanding of what is disciple making and uh, especially thinking about this as a way of life as a relation something that is very relational intergenerational and so on then another is to see like we've just talked national alliances really growing as platforms for collaboration and of course uh looking what are the ways to equip and to resource and to share so this is still being developed i don't want to create impression that there is a one place when the person can go and there will be everything is very clear everything is on the shelf so to say but our team has done some work to look around what are some models what are some resources and it's work in progress so one thing i want to mention is that there is a toolkit that we have developed that uh, we'll put the link into uh, this material so that just gathered what are some of the good exam current examples uh, of models Another resource is that a series of webinars that address various aspects. It's essentially conversation, sharing some good uh, models, and it's all on YouTube, and we also share a link about this. And I also want to ask Alliance leaders, uh, you know the models, we probably know the models that work, so please share with us. Share with us your stories, tell us what God is doing in your country, in the churches that you are connected with or serving at, tell us uh, the models that you seem, you've seen that seem to be gaining momentum. Mm. And also let's continue this conversation. Because again, it's not about us looking at a particular program. It's about all of us as fellow disciples of Christ, uh, just uh, journeying together and being friends together in this journey. In Luke 16, Jesus tells the story of a, a rich man and a poor man called Lazarus. They both die. Lazarus goes to paradise. The rich man goes to Hades. You, you know how the story goes. So, so what was the rich man's crime? I mean, there's nothing in Jesus' story that suggests he minded poor Lazarus lying at his gate or that you know, food scraps were being given to him from his dining table. Why did the rich man reap a reward of suffering and torment? Could it be that his crime was that he simply ignored the poor man that he knew was there? He simply lived his life in nonchalant, opulent luxury, didn't even notice, didn't seem to care. He either physically or metaphorically, he stepped over the poor man on his doorstep and he went about his life. I mean, what a tragedy to discover too late that he could have done something, but he chose not to. All around the world these past 18 months, the COVID-19 virus has wreaked havoc. It's no respecter of persons and national wealth, and yet there does seem to be an inequity in its impact. UN statistics are suggesting that more than 41 million people in 43 countries, around half of them children, are now literally at risk of starvation. Their situation exacerbated by conflict, climate change and the economic impacts of COVID-19. But what can we do? Surely we can't just ignore this. Well, the World Evangelical Alliance is collaborating with a large group of churches and Christian networks and with World Vision International to launch a weekend of prayer and action during 16th and 17th of October. This will coincide with the World Food Day on October 16th. It's an opportunity for Christ followers to unite in solidarity with those facing a dire future. During the course of the weekend, families, households and individuals are invited to share a meal with others, to pray specifically for those who are hungry, to spend time deliberately reflecting on the causes and the impact of hunger. And then on the 17th of October, we're encouraging local congregations to include a, a focus on this global hunger crisis within their weekly worship services. 
Well, well, attached to the letter that accompanies this video is a downloadable flyer and links to World Vision's Give Us Today Our Daily Bread webpage, where there's a, a spiritual toolkit. There are activities, resources for families as they discuss what they could do to feed Lazarus, who lies at our virtual gate. Well, we're inviting our national evangelical alliances to send out an invitation to their member churches to participate in this special time of focus. None of us on our own can solve the problem of world hunger, but every single one of us has a moral responsibility to at least do something. Will you join with us and help encourage your member churches to pray, to act in solidarity with those who are going hungry? So join with us on 16th and 17th of October. Well, I am the Well Pantoja. I'm uh, the National Director of the Philippine Council of Evangelical Churches. The Philippine Council of Evangelical Churches started in 1965. It started with four denominations, but right now there are 81 denominations from the very conservative Baptist to uh, full gospel, uh, Pentecostal, charismatic organizations have united uh, ourselves for the discipleship of the nation. So altogether, there are about 55,000 local churches uh, comprising of uh, 81 denominations, including 286 uh, parent church, missions organizations, NGO seminaries that uh, uh, believe in the vision and mission of PCEC. I've been serving for six years. In uh, 2014, uh, I was uh, the president of uh, the Conservative Baptist Association of the Philippines. This is uh, one uh, denomination that is very active with uh, PCEC, but I have uh, served in the board of PCEC for seven years. Uh, the Philippines is uh, facing um, very challenging uh, situations right now in the socio-economic, political, and uh, uh, cultural arena. Uh, the current administration president is, uh, uh, has been heard over the world, uh, one of the most uh, controversial uh, national leaders. Um, this uh, war on drugs has been noticed by the United Nations Human Rights Watch, the international uh, uh, criminal court because of uh, this administration's and the president's approach on the war on drugs. More than 7,000 people have been uh, uh, killed because of uh, the war on drugs and this is uh, uh, the uh, during police operations and of course uh, from uh, gang to gang, uh, from drug lord to drug lord, uh, cleansing their uh, their their group because uh, some who have been uh, caught and arrested with name names who are the uh, uh, members of the organizations and record. so it has been a uh, complicated uh, um, matter on the uh, war on drugs but the last two years has been uh, the most devastating and the most uh, difficult uh, in terms of uh, uh, many challenges uh, in the um, church scene because of the uh, quarantine, the lockdowns, uh, the, the churches are facing uh, major economic uh, breakdowns and challenges. Uh, and also in the edu education sector for two years, uh, 
because of the uh, lockdowns, uh, all students are in uh, online um, education system. So it's very challenging because in our country, more than 50% of the population do not have internet or they uh, so online education would not work. So it's in radio and uh, schools, students would receive uh, manuals and uh, paperwork that they do on their own and then listen uh, to uh, uh, lectures of their teachers online or on radio. So we're seeing these two years would be uh, the impact of this on the students would be really tough in uh, the coming days. But with all these uh, uh, challenges, the Lord has opened many opportunities. Uh, online uh, worship services have, uh, of churches have opened many opportunities. Some uh, congregations have doubled and tripled in terms of attendance in uh, their worship services. Uh, the prayer uh, gatherings in homes, the house church movements. So evangelism, discipleship, uh, online trainings, webinars have been uh, tremendous in the last uh, two years. So with uh, the many challenges that we face in the country, uh, praise God, uh, the church is, uh, uh, the God has uh, opened doors uh, for the church to be uh, penetrating or having many breakthroughs and doing new things that we have never done in the many years past. Uh, because of the uh, pandemic uh, crisis, uh, because of COVID-19, so it has uh, forced um, and I think it was God's way of uh, re reminding us of uh, what true church is. Our ministry is not just inside the church, but our ministry is in the homes, in the families, in the community, wherever we are, we should be evangelizing and discipling uh, our people. So the house churches have a multi multiplied by the millions in our country and uh, I would say uh, there is a new uh, there is a paradigm shift in the way people see uh, how discipleship is made it used to be uh, denominations uh, wanting to grow their denominations by the numbers by the number of churches but right now we're seeing that because of the online uh, ministries there's no walls. So people, uh, not only in, in one city, not only in one community, but the whole country and even their friends around the world are seeing a, a tremendous work of a local church through their online ministries. So with every challenge, there are great opportunities that God has placed uh, in the Philippines. So. Uh, uh, praise the Lord for uh, uh, the challenges that have come, but we are seeing greater faith and greater resolve of, uh, of, of the church to move forward with uh, the discipleship of the Philippines. Thanks for joining us in this first AED video blog. We'd love to get your feedback and we hope you'll join us next time as we tell stories of what's happening in other alliances just like yours.